Okay, now let us welcome uh, Dr. Ian Wairua. Wairua. He is a husband, a father, and uh, he's a teacher. He has specialized in, uh, in applied technologies and language. Um, he has uh, facilitated uh, numerous sessions in the use of modern te technology, IT, and uh, to parents and teachers and other groups. And he is based at uh, Strathmore University. Welcome, Dr. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Am I audible You're enough? Yes. Thank you, and thank you everyone. Thank you, Sitam, for inviting me again to speak to you, to speak to parents. I'm very happy to be here. I thank God for this opportunity. Um, please allow me to share my screen. If you give me rights uh, to share my screen, I would like to show a number of things. Uh, this is a very, very important topic that we are about to handle. Uh, the use of technology, the effect of technology on parenting uh, is one of the areas uh, that we really, really need to understand as parents. Is it possible, uh, Amos or uh, Tony, to make me uh, an organizer, a host, so that I can share my screen, please? Let me just organize for that, just a minute. Thank you. So one of the things that um, I would like us to think about from the outset is the fact that actually connected technologies are pretty young, uh, younger than we think. The internet, uh, if you think about the history, um, Tim Berners-Lee, that Oxford computer science professor who decided to give out the source code for the WWW, that was just 1993, just 30 years ago, 31 years this year. That's when we really had the internet. So in one generation, we have a technology that uh, has taken over the entire world. Globally, uh, it's a technology that uh, is found everywhere. This is unprecedented in the history of technology. It's not uh, typical for that to happen. But then there has been effects, and that's what I would like to talk about and <clears throat> how those effects uh, run into parenting. Uh, just a second, I think I'll have to share that again, just to make sure I include sound. Ah, there we go. All right, so first I would like to begin with a brief. Um, about what the status of this technology is, what exactly are we looking at, what's the context? And I'm very grateful, I'm indebted to a company called Meltwater. It's a media intelligence company working together with a, a social media company called We Are Social. And they've published all these data online so you can find this data yourself later. And this is the situation currently. If you think of the, the entire world as populated by 8 billion of us, already 5 billion of us are on social media, uh, slightly more 5.35 billion of us are using the internet. It's important to remember that uh, um, about a billion people, actually 1.2 billion people are either too old, above 80 years, or too young. 
And, and then if you also include about 2 billion others who uh, do not have access because where they live, there is no infrastructure, you're actually left with everybody else is on the internet. Every person who can be on the internet uses the internet. We are talking about 5.35 billion of us. This background is important for what we are going to discuss. Um, and here you can see that after 1993, and the experts let go of the source code, so we all now suddenly had access to browsers. All of a sudden, in the last 30 years, uh, you have this graph there. I want to move on. Um, this is the social media timeline. Again, you see a similar trend. We started off uh, social media. If you think of Facebook, for instance, 2004, 2005, uh, it's now 20 years old. Actually, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is going to celebrate 20 years of Facebook. Um, since he launched it from his college classroom um, in 2004, it's going to be 20 years this year. Actually, it's already passed because that was February 2004. So uh, 20 years this year. Then uh, this is an interesting graph. I don't have too much time to go into the detail, but I think you can see something very interesting about this graph. If you start from the very right, what you're seeing there is Japan. And what you're seeing on Japan is 0 0.53, which is the number of hours they spend in Japan on social media. But I hope you can see who is at the very, very other end there on the left. And that's our dear motherland, Kenya. Uh, this is the latest research. We Kenyans are at the top of the league table. We are spending 3.43 hours daily uh, on social media. On average, globally, it's 2.23 hours. You can see that white part of the graph there. Uh, so this is very interesting for those of you who are Kenyans, those of you who are uh, logged in from Kenya, which is the majority of us, it tells us something. And we have to ask ourselves why, how come we are consuming more social media per person per hour, uh, sorry, per day than other people. Yeah. Um, at the same time, there's something to be said about the ages. So if we go back now to Japan, which is now on the left end of your screen, the average age, the median age of the population uh, is, is 49. And you can see worldwide the white part of this graph, it's 30.6 years. And Kenya is close to the extreme right, 19.7. That means, now this is not uh, the typical average, this is the median, which just means that there are as many people above as below uh, that age. So that should also tell you something. And then I wanted to show you these two, also published by We Are Social. Uh, data collected by the company, a media intelligence company called Meltwater. And what you're seeing there is the age distributions and what we do online depending on our age. So on the very left there, you have 16 to 24 year olds. On the right, at the end there, you have 55 to 64 year olds. Well, one of the things you'll notice is at the top there, we are all doing more or less the same things. Chatting and messaging is the most popular activity whenever we face our screens. And then after that, we go to social networks. But notice that for the young people between 16 and 24, that is inverted. That, that primarily they are not there just to communicate one-on-one, -on -one, which is hopefully what we do when we are chatting and messaging. 
but they go first of all to social media, okay, before chatting. Um, that tells us something also. Um, although when you look at the percentages, they're not that different. Okay? Social networks and chatting, these are the main reasons we go on to social media. Now, the, the other, only one other thing I want you to note about this, although there are many things we could say here, is games, okay, gaming. So 42.9% of recipients who were asked what they do uh, for 16 to 24 year olds, games. But if you look at all the other categories, games do not appear at all. Instead, what you're seeing is a category known as news, 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 news. And you won't find news here for the 16 to 24 year olds. Uh, if we could go into breakout rooms, I'm sure you would tell me a lot about why that is so. But let me just show you one more graph and then we'll go into details on our topic. This is what we, the, the social media apps that we are using. TikTok is at the top of the league. Uh, we spend 34 hours <laughs> every month on TikTok and 28 hours every month on YouTube. Now, TikTok is just seven years old. Uh, it was launched in 2016. It's the youngest of all these apps that you're looking at on your screen. And it's already at the top of the league there. If you add 36 hours and 28 hours, uh, in my work, I deal with 20-year-olds. Now, my 20-year-old students are, have an average of six social media apps on their phones, six. I'm assuming you and I have maybe three or four. <laughs> but if you have TikTok and YouTube, then if you're an average human being today, you're spending a total of 62 hours per month on TikTok and YouTube. Now, if you remember that you, we typically work a 40 hour week, 60 hours means that you're spending a week and a half a month on social media. <laughs> <laughs> network. It's a lot of time. And that's one of the first things I wanted us to think about. How much time are we spending on social media? And what's the impact of that? How about our children? How much time are they spending on social media? What's the impact of that? Now, I don't want us to take a negative angle about technology, especially connected technology. I want us to begin actually by thinking about the positives, the positives, because technology itself is not evil. Technology is just technology. It's the way we use it that matters. It's the person who is using technology that determines uh, <laughs> what will happen. Just like a gun, having a gun is not evil. If you have a gun and then you lock it up in your drawer and then you come back one week later, how many people will the gun have killed? Zero. It's not the gun, it's the person. It's the same thing with technology. And so I wanted us to start early on with the positives. I like to discuss the positives of uh, social media with this particular example. Um, most of you will recognize what language that is, Ukshona Kwelanga. Even though you don't speak Zulu, I'm sure many of you have already guessed that must be Zulu. <laughs> well, um, let's watch this. Tell me if you don't hear any sound. Funerals are a big deal in South Africa, and when they happen, the cost can be crippling and cause major drama among family members. 
To illustrate the tensions that come with not being covered, you may have to increase your volume. That played out in a completely unexpected place. WhatsApp is the most popular digital platform among our audience, where many family conversations take place. So we launched Ukshona Gwelanga, a drama series told entirely through WhatsApp. Our audience were invited to follow the fictional Langa family's WhatsApp group over seven daily episodes leading up to the funeral of the father. Messages were sent throughout the day as the characters' plans started to unravel and the clash of traditional expectations and modern realities started to hit home. The story was written in collaboration with Vaughn Indaba, one of South Africa's leading scriptwriters. The challenge was how you put it on WhatsApp because, I mean, as you know, it's the first. No, I, we, we didn't have any example to say these people, they did it, they did it like this. I wrote the TV episode and we had to sit and say, how do you plan it? How do we make it fit on WhatsApp? Some of the country's best known actors took on the roles of the family in photos, video clips and voice notes from their character's perspective. The man will bury today was my dearest friend. Like any major drama series, we launched a promotional campaign to build an audience through traditional media, PR, and a series trailer promoted across social media. We captured the attention of our audience in a way that is beyond expectations for the category or any piece of advertising. And the campaign has been celebrated for pioneering an entirely new format for digital dramas. Now, I hope that's interesting to all of you that an entire promotional campaign, marketing campaign, could be organized on WhatsApp. Now, when this was first done in 2018, it was quite a surprise. Maybe now it wouldn't surprise anybody. But the point I'm trying to make here is that so-called social media is really a workplace for those who know how to use it. For our children, as they grow up, they will use these spaces productively to earn money, to work. Okay? Uh, they will come up with various innovations. And therefore, it would be foolish of me, I think, to, for instance, to be on social media or just be denying her a piece now, let me show you just one more thing. What you are looking at on your screen now is just a drawing of an activity that was very popular in the last century, which was whaling, catching of whales. It was highly profitable. If you catch a whale, um, something about the whale is that everything about that whale gets you money from the skin to the bones to the meat. In fact, what they do is after they catch the whale and they remove the skin, which is very expensive and is used for making different types of artifacts, they, they slice off large slabs of meat which are just below the surface and that's boiled for oil. Uh, whale oil is very, very useful. It has no smell, but it can be used um, for cosmetics. It can be used for cooking even. It can be used as lamp fuel and so on. And then you get to the flesh itself. Then you get to the teeth, the bones. All these can be used for various purposes. And you just need to catch one whale in a year and you're good to go. You'll pay uh, the, the people from whom you had the boat, the, the ship. You'll pay the sailors and so on. But anyway, what I want to tell you is that in New Zealand, uh, they, they had a culture of whaling uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. And so they have folk songs about whaling. Now, three years ago, in the middle of COVID, there was this guy in Scotland. He's just a high school graduate, started working 26 years old that time, and his job is just to deliver mail. He delivers parcels around the town where he lives in Scotland. 
And then like most young people, he decides to sing. So he sang a song and like most young people today recorded himself singing. And then he posted it where? On TikTok, of course, like all young people do. It's not his song. The song he sang was from New Zealand. It was a sailor song. Okay. A sea shanty. A sea shanty is a type of music that is sung by sailors. And the song that he sang went viral. It was so viral that uh, probably all of you had this song during COVID. If you had. Is it just me or we can't hear you? Yeah, we seem to have lost him. Hello. Uh -huh. uh, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I got a message that somebody removed me. All right. Uh, let me try to get Welcome back, back where Mr. I was. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can get back to where I was. I was talking about uh, Nathan Evans. Nathan Evans uh, sang a song that went viral. And um, then after it went viral on TikTok, he decided to sing it on YouTube, on his YouTube channel. Whoa, when he went to YouTube, this is what happened. Let me see if I can show you the next slide. I'm sure you've heard this. Well, you must have heard that song. It's the Wella Man. As you can see there, uh, how many people have viewed the song after he put it on YouTube? 338 million people. Um, it's been liked by 4.9 million people. He has 1.6 million subscribers on his channel. Do you think he still delivers mail? If you have that type of number of subscribers on your YouTube channel, if you have a song with 338 million views, are you going to be delivering mail? Of course not. He doesn't deliver mail anymore. He travels the world as a famous musician. <laughs> so this is a bit different from what you and I are used to. Um, a musician didn't just come up like that during our time, okay? But it's a brave new age, and this is the age of our children, and they have different ways of making their way in life and they have such opportunities. And I like to use this just to illustrate to you that they need this space. They need to learn how this is done, okay? And they need to make their choices differently from ours. Uh, of course, uh, these are just two examples, two extreme examples, but I hope they illustrate my point uh, accurately. So now let me talk about how we use social media, and maybe even how we misuse it and abuse it so that I can come quickly to uh, the parenting aspect. Um, just a second, let me uh, share this, include sound. Ah, here we go. All right. Now, it's very important for us to realize that Use sometimes leads to overuse. And when people overuse something, sometimes they become dependent on it. And dependence can lead to addiction. 
this path is well known to you and I when it comes to our screen, the way we use our screens. It's not just our children, but ourselves. We may be addicted. Now, overuse itself is not good because it means that there are things we should be doing, but we are not doing them because we are on WhatsApp, we are on YouTube, we're just browsing the internet when we could be doing something better, okay? So use itself, even if it's not overuse, could be misuse. And then if we are online, if I'm online abusing people or uh, conducting some fraud or some other criminal activity, this could be abuse. Therefore, use itself could be misuse and could be abuse even before it becomes overuse. When it becomes overuse, it could lead to dependence and addiction. And we know that this can lead to mental health issues, depression, anxiety. Uh, we are already seeing at the college level, my 20 year old students with less self-confidence, suffering emotional tension and so on. Uh, it's a familiar sight in households around the world. Children being entertained. I hope it's audible. By technology. But this is also familiar. Monumental meltdowns when the devices are taken away. Their reactions that are in fact symptoms of one of the major medical challenges of our time. What's being called internet addiction disorder. And it has mental health experts worried about children and their parents' actions. I don't know about you, but in my case, every other family I visit, whether it's our relatives, when we met for Easter, when we met for Christmas, increasingly I'm seeing these five-year-olds, four-year-old children who have to be appeased all the time with a phone. Mami nipesimu. And the kid will do nothing, absolutely nothing, until they are bribed with a phone. And if you don't give the phone, they become violent, they have tantrums, they... And, and I look at the mother and I, I just feel pity because you can see the helplessness of the mother in all these cases. And it is my view, I have not seen any study yet about this, but it is my view that this is increasing. And what you just watched, that very short clip from Australia, uh, 60 Minutes is a TV program in Australia, uh, is something that is more Kenyan than Australian, by the way. Eh? Internet addiction disorder among young children is a big problem now. But is it just a problem for children? For gambling, but Tam's talking about her addiction to the internet, especially online gaming. How bad is it? At the worst, I was gaming for 16 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, nonstop. Tam was a prisoner of the online world. Married with a young son, her daily life was completely consumed by surfing the internet and playing games like Tetris and Solitaire. So much so, she chose her computer over her family. When you were at, at the worst, how did your life collapse around you? My son was at a friend's house on a play date. And I knew that if I didn't go and collect him and go home and make dinner and just get on with the evening, that that was it, it was going to be over. And I thought, I can't handle that, that's too big, I'm going. And I left and I went internet cafe hopping that night and I spent the night at an internet cafe. Um, and I, that was the real rock bottom. That was the day that I made the decision that I was going to turn my back on my life and my family and choose gaming. And even though I had hit rock bottom already and I knew how bad things could get, I still chose gaming. 
Tam acknowledges she has internet addiction disorder. So you can imagine how serious that is. Um, she was so addicted that she, one day she didn't pick up her son. Okay. And she continued gaming overnight. Can you imagine how serious that is? Um, I just chose a very short clip there. But Tam's talk what does this place offer? It's a chance to, as apropos as it is, unplug. In Seattle, Washington, 25-year-old Tom is a patient at America's first residential treatment facility for internet addiction. It's called Restart. This peaceful homestead is off the grid. No phones, I think no it's devices, the setting and the definitely the no internet. At one point in my life, I handed my future, my free will, I handed myself over to a machine and let it dictate what I did. So you were addicted to the internet, addicted was, to your computer. I was addicted to gaming, browsing, porn. Yeah, I was addicted to the computer. So to unhook himself, Tom's checked in here for a 45 day digital detox. It might seem an extreme measure, but at its worst, Tom was spending 18 hours of every day online. It was a way of numbing out, not having to deal with real life. So through the internet, you were escaping real life. Mm -hmm. Through my games, I was living out more exciting lives. Who were you online then? Whoever I wanted to be. Wow, imagine that. A place where you can go and do digital detox. So this problem is so serious in the world that they, they now have rehabilitation centers, okay? Uh, let's call it Facebook hospital, <laughs> uh, where you can actually go and get treated. So it is that serious, and I wanted you to be aware of that. Um, and this is one of the things I hope you will remember. You and I, everybody needs every now and then digital detox. We need screen detox. We need gadget detox. You need to set aside every week, sometime, 30 minutes, maybe one hour, maybe a whole afternoon on Sunday or some other day when you go off gadgets. This detox is good for your health and much more than for your health, mental health and physical health, for your family and for just reflecting about your life and getting away from this type of addiction. Uh, let me move on. It's not just addiction. There are many other problems, eh? but I wanted to focus quite a bit on addiction. But let me show you a series of other problems that come from use, uh, misuse, abuse, overuse, and dependency.
Yes, so some people find this shocking that uh, your phone carries 10 times more germs than toilet seats. Why is that shocking? Because it is shocking. <laughs> so all the time you're touching a toilet seat and you're carrying it around with you everywhere you go, to work, uh, to the restaurant, to the dining room and so on. You clean your hands and then you pick up the phone again, 10 times more germs than a toilet seat. Uh, it's important to clean our phones, uh, sanitize your phone. Uh, sometimes we forget that. Uh, let me just move on. Another thing, uh, distraction. Look at that. She just walked out of a supermarket, but because she was on her phone, <laughs> That's what happens. OK, so there's the risk of accident just because we are glued to our screen. Next, imitation. Okay, uh, I love that clip by Flacco. Now, the, the point here is simple, imitation. This is especially important for us to keep in mind when we are thinking about our children. They are likely to try and imitate what they see online. Often it is innocent, harmless, but not all the time. One of the things, especially those of us who have little girls, we have to keep in mind that a lot of times they have negative body image. Some of you may know the story of Instagram and how uh, they were sued. They, they had problems convincing Congress that there isn't something wrong with the algorithm because of the number of young girls who had negative body image and were messing up their, their bodies simply because they wanted to look better. And the use of filters and so on doesn't seem to help. Negative body image. What you're looking at there on the screen is a lady called Anastasia. She's an influencer. She's on Instagram. And she is a very good example of this. She was uh, in the news some years back because of negative body image. What you are looking at is how she looked like before. At the beginning when she set up her uh, Instagram account, but then over the years she has decided she doesn't look good enough. So she started injecting herself with stuff to look better. And now she looks a lot better than this. I'm going to show you how she looks like now. You're really, really going to like this. She is so, so beautiful, amazing. Wait for it here. Oops, sorry. There. OK, all right. I think the point is made. I'll just move on. Um, one more thing here. Just a quick message. Um, people have been telling us about the um, TikTok hack doing porch eggs in the microwave. Well, this is what's happened to me. I've literally burnt my full face, my neck off. I'm just saying, please do not do that egg cup challenge. Okay, so there is a tendency to imitate, to try it out. What people are doing there, um, the young children will watch a video and they want to try it out immediately, what they've seen. Um, 
it could be very dangerous, as you've seen on that clip. Now, uh, I want to go to the last part. Can it get worse than that, do you think? Is it dangerous? This is just virtual stuff. Eh? Surely it's not like it's life threatening or anything, right? Right? Well, um, let me show you something and then we'll make up our minds. I'm sure you've seen the challenges one after the other on TikTok. The young people, especially teenagers, are likely to seek affirmation from their peers by trying out those challenges. The riskier the challenge, the more likely they are to try it out. The viral milk crate challenge is TikTok's latest trend, but as much as you think you may know how to conquer this dangerous feat, you may want to think again as it's caused more harm. Does it have sound? Let's get into it. The popular saying goes, there's no crime yes, over spilled milk, but within about 60 seconds of opening the TikTok app, you'll quickly find that there's actually a lot of crying over spilled milk crates happening. That's right, the newest viral challenge has taken the internet, as well as hospitals by storm, after many attempts to put their best foot forward only to end up with their worst injury lying dead ahead. In case you don't know what we're talking about, this challenge, which was reportedly first showcased on Facebook, later making its way to TikTok, garnering a collective 15.3 million views, involves stacking plastic milk crates ascending like stairs in which challengers have to climb each of them up and back down without taking a tumble. And let's just say people are failing miserably, so much so that they are even ending up with severe injuries. Multiple people have failed on the first few steps alone, while some are on their descent back down and just can't seem to contain their balance. Despite the fact that one Houston woman who's gone viral put literally everyone to shame and while wearing heels, this challenge is not for the faint of heart and quite literally could land you in the hospital. This Twitter user stated, ICUs filling up, half COVID patients, half milk crate challenge victims. Another person shared a meme with the caption, them insurance companies watching y'all do the milk crate challenge like. Unsurprisingly, medical experts are highly advising milk crate participants against partaking in this harmful stunt. Dr. Sean Anthony, an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in sports medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, told the Today Show, quote, the milk crate challenge is very dangerous and we are seeing many orthopedic injuries as a result of the falls. He added, injuries can include broken wrists, shoulder dislocations, ACL and meniscus tears, as well as life-threatening conditions like spinal cord injuries. Some celebrities have weighed in on the challenge, poking fun at the mindless trend, including Snoop Dogg, who made a recent appearance on Jimmy Kimmel Live with guest host Stephen A. Smith, when he commentated one challenge, and I'm not gonna lie, his play-by-play -play had me rolling on the ground, but not as hard as this dude. Don't, uh-uh, uh, them shoes is too big for this situation. <laughs> they too big. When you start to shake, you know it's gonna break. Oh! Mark Ruffalo also joked that his Marvel character, the Hulk, refuses to partake in the milk crate challenge due to his hatred of stairs. All jokes aside, although it may be entertaining to watch, this challenge is extremely dangerous and should be taken with caution and maybe some full protective gear should you choose to take the plunge. Okay, so the danger is real. Um, Life-threatening danger, okay? Uh, let me show you something else. Wrapping a ban on TikTok users who haven't verified their age after a 10-year-old girl died in a horrific blackout challenge on the video sharing app. The online game involves people choking themselves to temporarily pass out, but the Sicilian youngster was found dead in her bathroom. The medics did everything they could to bring the child back. To so it's almost ridiculous sometimes. Some of these challenges a choking challenge. Why would you choke yourself to death? Because somebody posted such a challenge on TikTok. 
Italian lawyer specializing okay. in online cases told us social networks, in his view, must do much more. All right. Forms of choice for young online users around the world, Kenya included. And there's a reason TikTok has managed to attract 1.6 billion active monthly users. Well, the content is irresistible and engaging and at times addictive. There have been concerns, however, on how the platform is used after dark, particularly the live feature. Well, I sought to find out just what goes on on the other side of the TikTok app. If you are one of TikTok's 8 million or so users in Kenya, you're probably going to be met with this. Or this. Hey! <laughs> Seven. <laughs> One. Or this. Met my husband when I was 37, got married at 39, had my first baby right before my 40th birthday, and my second baby when I was 43. There's still time. It's what's made the platform so popular and even more so lucrative for content creators. However, when darkness falls, you get a completely different experience. This tweet a few months ago attracted quite a bit of reaction from users sharing their own experiences. I decided to venture into this murky side of the popular social media platform to see just what goes on there. At some minutes to 11 p.m. Kenya time, this host begins advertising, not clothes or shoes, but explicit videos of herself. She directs followers that have now hit close to 400 on this live on how to make purchases. Whoever don't hear, if you are from America, you said it's $15. If you are from Europe, $15, 15 euro. If you are from UK, you said 15, 15 what, pounds, I don't know. I am selling my... The clock hasn't even struck midnight. In the comments of this host, a user asks the host to perform a sexually suggestive act. Another female host posts an explicit handwritten letter asking to be in the company of a man. You're also met with countless live streams of women suggestively dancing in front of the camera, urging those who've tuned in to send a gift. The icons of either a rose worth one coin or perfume worth 20 coins at the bottom of the screen. TikTok's terms of service under community guidelines are very clear, stating, quote, you may not use the services to upload, transmit, distribute, store, or otherwise make available in any way, including for the purposes of creating and or streaming content, any user content that is obscene, pornographic, and or pedophilic. However, Kenyan TikTokers prefer to go live way past bedtime because they are likely to find individuals who won't report them. Zoom 200. You are going for 200. But going live on TikTok is hardly about the attention. It is the easiest way to earn from the platform. When one hosts a live video, their followers can send them a gift in the form of coins, which they can later redeem for cash. How many face likes to dance? I'm wondering how many church dance with church. <laughs> this quest for extra income attracts individuals willing to do practically anything. The concern, however, is who is watching. Twerking videos. Make sure you follow, follow guys. Follow for more videos. With such content so easily accessible on the platform, how is one so sure the consumers are 18 or over? Guys, turn the screen for me. TikTok has a battalion of moderators specifically tasked with flagging such content. The question is, why haven't they yet? Okay, so who is watching? Well, uh, it's not good for our children. It's not good for us either, you and I. 
it's not good for anyone. Why is it happening? I think you have got a good idea of uh, <laughs> the social media environment in which we live. But it gets worse. Eh? You may remember uh, three years ago about this teenage girl who was lured. Um, she was going to be kidnapped. God knows what would have happened to her if she hadn't been rescued. Can this really happen? Is it easy for just anyone to talk to your teenage daughter and get them get into a bus? And somebody actually decided to try out an experiment. And with the connivance of the parents, checked if he could lure out of the house a 12-year-old girl, a 13-year-old girl, and a 14-year-old girl. The parents were saying, no, it can't happen to my daughter. She's very careful. My daughter is, is really good. Now, this is what happened. What's up, guys? I'm Kobe Person. How easy is it for a pedophile to pick up an underage child using social media? Well, today we're going to find that out. I made a fake profile on Facebook posing as a 15-year-old boy. With the parents' permission, I friend requested three girls ages 14, 13 and 12 years old. I've been talking to these girls for the last three or four days, and today we're supposed to meet up. What we found in this video is shocking and something everyone should see. Be sure to watch until the end and use what we've learned in this video to better educate your friends and family. Hope you guys enjoy the video. Okay, so he's going to try and lure a 12 year old girl. Um, the parents are aware. They think it won't happen. A 13 year old girl and a 14-year-old separately. He's pretending to be a 15-year-old boy. Let's see what happens. This first girl, her name is Michaela. She's 13 years old. We've been talking on Facebook for the last couple of days, and we're supposed to meet up at the park later when her parents leave the house. I'm just waiting right now for to get the text that her parents have left the house. So we just got a text. My parents just left. I can be at the park in 10 minutes. So we're gonna go see if she comes in 10 minutes. We're gonna go right now, set up all the cameras and uh, just be waiting there for her. So she said she's gonna meet me at the park playground. So uh, this is the closest to her house, she said. So right now I'm texting her that I just got here. All right, we'll just wait, see what she says. She said, okay, I'll be there in five minutes. The dad is hiding somewhere in the neighborhood. Mind you, she's only 13. Oh, she's coming, yep. Michaela? Right here. From Facebook. Do you remember? Michaela! Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Sorry. He could have been a rapist. He could have been a pedophile. Why would you do this? Sorry. Yeah, you know that. I could have been anyone. Like, you... You talked to me for the last four days. You've been talking to me on Facebook. You just, you know that, like, don't, you shouldn't talk to strangers, especially online. Like, I wasn't even the, do I look the same as my picture? It could be even worse than that. You realize how scary this could have been? Yeah. We have to talk. This next girl, her name is Juliana. She's 12 years old, and we're supposed to meet up tonight when her father falls asleep. So right now I'm here with John who's uh, Juliana's father. We're gonna see if she's actually gonna come to the door or not. She said, this was the last text, LOL, I would have to wait till my dad falls asleep if you wanna chill, because I can't have boys over. So she wants to chill tonight, supposedly. Um, what do you think about that? I don't think she's gonna open the door. God, I hope she doesn't open that door. What's your address? I pray she yeah, does not like, respond to this. Well, I can't say the address, but she just literally just texted the address. Start driving to the address close by. My dad's going to drop me off. All right, so she just said, I think my dad fell asleep. You can come now. One with the light right here? Yes. Come outside. Come to the front door. Ready? 
Yok. You gotta get over here. Get over here. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I'm sorry. How can you do this? You're 12 years old. This guy's 20 years old. You could have been raped and murdered. We already lost your mother. What would I do if anything happened to you? What would I do if anything happened to you? I love you. Don't you ever do this again. Don't you ever do anything like this again. Sorry. This next girl, her name is Jenna. She's 14 years old. We've been talking online over text message and even had a phone conversation. So right now we have the parents of Jenna. Jenna thinks her parents are going out tonight for date night. She thinks my brother is going to be driving, so she's going to get in the car, but she doesn't actually know that it's all just me. So I'm going to text her right now. Did your parents leave yet? Yeah, like 15 minutes ago. Do you think she's going to go through with this? No way. Absolutely not. I don't even believe it's us. Okay. Probably one of her friends playing around. What's your address? All right, is this, is this your house? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's go. All right. We are here to come out. You don't think she's coming out? She better not be coming out. Oh, I see your door opening. Yeah. Yep. I see someone. Can't believe this. Yeah, yeah. Hop in. He's in the back. Over here. <laughs> Jenna, stop it, your mother or father. Jenna, look, turn around. Turn around. Turn around. How could you dare go into a stranger's car? What are you thinking? Just explain Give me your me. phone right now. Give me your phone now. What would have happened if you came out and it wasn't us sitting back here and there were really crazy people back here? We never would have saw you again. We watched movies together. We've looked at newspaper articles and the news that all these things are real life situations that have happened. And we've discussed them. What, you think it's fine to go try that on your own? But what happened is this man would have drove away and there would have been three strangers sitting in this car. Huh? What would you have done? What would we have done? When we didn't have our daughter. I mean, you understand, you probably thought you were talking to 15 year olds you didn't even know what was happening, did you? You just got in like that. You were going with everything I was saying. You understand now, so never ever do that again. This will teach you a lesson forever, your whole life. I wonder how you would have reacted if we had time, if this was a face-to-face -face, uh, seminar. One of the things I would have asked you is to tell me uh, what you think about the parents, the two fathers first, how they reacted, and uh, this last case where you had the couple, and you probably noticed some difference in the way the parents react. How would you have reacted to that? But the point, the important point is that social media leads to kidnappings, okay? There is a lot of it happening, more than you know, more than you think. Uh, not just in the West, but also here, okay? But let me now move to what the experts are saying. Let, let me uh, close that chapter of scenarios and come to, so what exactly is going on here? Um, we don't have too much time, so I'll focus on the first case, excess screen use. What happens when we spend too much time on the screen on our gadget? So the data is now coming in uh, quickly. It's now 30 years since we started using screens uh, rapidly uh, all the time. And the brain scans are showing clearly that there is damage uh, to the brain. So I'd like to show you just a bit of that. Um, just a second. Let me see if I can open the correct slide. Uh, here it is, yes. 
So there is evidence of damage to the brain, especially for young children, if they are spending too much time on the screen. The areas of the brain that are damaged are those that have to do with decision making, emotional processing, self-control, and paying attention, focusing. So as you can imagine, this has quite a bit of effect. Yeah. So people are taking, the young people are taking even more risk because they are not good at making decisions. Those tantrums, the violence that I get from my child because of uh, he wants the phone. You see damage in the area of the brain responsible for emotional processing, self-control. If they can't pay attention on about one thing, on one thing at a time, this has an effect on their performance in school. Earlier on, I mentioned low self-esteem, impulsiveness. The question of poor sleep has major repercussions on their health, both mental and physical health, mood disorders, depression. So these are some of the things that we are now seeing from the scientists as the data comes in. I also want you to start paying attention to the signs of addiction. If you find that your child prioritizes screens, spends a noticeable amount of time on the screen and with a gadget, the whole of Saturday morning, for instance, even when it interferes with other activities such as their homework, okay, physical exercise, socializing, family time, uh, etc. Even when there are negative consequences, clear negative consequences, they still persist. That's a sign of addiction. If they seem frustrated through tantrums, they're anxious, they have mood swings when they're unable to use. For instance, the battery is down and there's no power, there's a blackout, and that's a sign. Aggression, always fighting with their siblings on matters that relate to the use of a gadget or the TV screen. They get irritable, angry, agitated when you mention the amount of time. Hey, mm, Kevin, you're spending too much time on the phone and suddenly just that mention causes him to get extremely angry, okay? disproportionately angry, starts hiding in his room, sneaky screen use whenever they are using their laptop or tablet. That's a sign of addiction. Okay. I've mentioned sleep. This is very important, including for you. Um, it's true we have webinars in the evenings like this one, but I suggest that it's very good for your health if you go off screens from around 6 p.m. You get better sleep. If you, if you must use screens, try to use dark backgrounds like I do. You can see my slides have black. Uh, backgrounds. Try to reduce the blue light. Uh, if you're using screens to get relief from certain anxieties, from pressure of life, from certain challenges, you, you get a certain level of relief when you go online and use social media or WhatsApp or TikTok. Well, that's a sign. If previously you could do with one hour only per day of social media, but now suddenly you find yourself, you can tolerate much higher levels of screen time. Again, these are signs. I like to talk about this study because it's, uh, it's probably the best scientific study I have seen so far. It's a Japanese study. Uh, they followed 7,097 mother-child pairs for four years, okay? And they just checked who was allowing their child to have screen time, who was not allowing their child to have screen time, what was the effect, okay? At one year, they made a record. And then at two years, they checked 
developmental milestones, like uh, has the child uh, been able to communicate, to say daddy, mommy, to talk at four years, and so on, and all the other usual milestones. Can the child walk? Can they solve problems and so on? When you give them bricks, can they separate the bricks into colors or build them up or something like that? And the shocking result, and this is just last year, eh? this study came out last year in August. So it's brand new and I haven't seen any other study like this. It's just amazing. And it was very, very well designed. Eh? Um, they found that all the children who are exposed to screens were missing developmental milestones especially for communication and problem solving. Significant delays. These kids can hardly talk. And even if they talk, they are still behind their peers who had zero screen time or less screen time. It's important that we begin to pay attention to these studies. I want to show you something else which is a bit older. So this was last year, but we already knew from 10 years ago that young children, young adults also, boys especially, who are addicted to social media. Uh, if you read that, those of you who are in this field probably understand what all that means, but let me use layman's language. Their brains are shrinking. The more they watch porn, the smaller the brain. The brain is just shrinking, you know? And a lot more <laughs> is happening. Eh? Um, so let me come to what we should do. So I could go on and on and on. I can show you hundreds of cases of what's happening uh, if we abuse, if we overuse, misuse, if we get dependent on our screens. And this is for both the children and the parents. But I have tried to summarize uh, what we should be doing as parents. So, and I put it in one slide so that we can remember. And the acronym is GEAL, G-E-A-L. G stands for gadgets. Parents need to take charge of gadgets. You are the one who bought the phone. You are the one who bought the tablet. You are the one who bought that laptop for your son or for your daughter. It's yours. It's not his. Okay. Take charge. You should control when they use it for what and for how long. Okay. It doesn't belong to them. And I could give you many, many reasons why this is important. Fix screen times. Decide when they will use their laptop and when they will not. Start early. If you don't start early, it becomes more difficult when they are already teenage to start creating these rules. E stands for environment. Take charge of the environment. Set up tech free zones in your house. So it could be the living room, sitting room, could be the dining area the table or some place where no technology at all is allowed. You need to do this, believe you me. There has to be spaces that are tech free. So the first one, gadgets, was about taking charge and fixing time. The second one is about spaces. Set up tech free zones in your house. A number of parents have actually started doing this, and many of them are setting up bedrooms as tech-free zones. But of course, this means you have to be the example. If you can't do it, don't expect your kids to do it. So you have to display, you have to be the model that they follow. Then you need criteria for healthy online spaces. You need to learn how to explain to your children why it is not right to do something. Why is it not right? God in his wisdom does not set rules blindly. There are very good reasons. 
And science just supports what God says. So start with what God says, follow up with the science, because the science always shows that God was right. If you get the correct science, get it, it's there. The next is about activities, A, activities. You need to decide as a parent what your children should be doing. Especially they need to get involved in real life activities, visiting relatives, going to healthy places, uh, going to church and so on. Um, spend time with the children yourself so that they understand what real life activities are. Conversations with neighbors, with relatives, healthy conversations, playing games, etc. And then take up leadership. This perhaps is the most important of them all. Your children learn from what you do, not what you say. If they notice that there are visitors in your house and when a call comes through to you, you look at it and then you tell your visitors, excuse me, this is a very important call. I need to take it. And then you walk out of the room. Uh, your children learn something about that, about respecting visitors, about uh, not just taking the call and shouting into your phone in front of people. If sometimes you ignore the calls after looking at who is calling and saying, ah, I'll call this person later, they realize that there are things that are more important than the gadget itself. If they see you're watching something on TV and it reaches a certain point and you switch off, they're curious, why did you do that? Why didn't you want to watch that? Can you explain it to them? Take up leadership, okay? Show them that human beings are more important than gadgets. Set good example for others, not just your children, but for your other relatives. Okay. Learn, know the signs. I mentioned a bit some of the signs of addiction, but there are many other things we could talk about if we had time. Learn them. Um, spend time with the kids. Notice that that has come up twice. Um, the more the time you spend with your child, the better. Quality time, conversing, explaining. Let them learn what your values are from you. Uh, my daughter should not try to get affirmation from likes on Instagram. Why can't I tell her myself, hey, my daughter, you look nice. Your new hairstyle is really nice. If she hears it from me, then she's less likely to go looking for affirmation online. I want to stop here. I hope this very, very succinct summary helps. The one on your screen right now, because it summarizes everything that we need to do. And if I get time another day, we could go into greater detail for each of them. But I hope this is good enough. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. I could take questions now or comments. I have a question. <clears throat> yes. Uh, now, uh, what of we parents who already have teenagers and uh, these precautions were not taken? And especially, let me speak for the single parents who only have one child. For instance, myself, Mapenzi is my only child. She's uh, 15 years old. And uh, her number, her, besides me, when I'm in the house, her company, besides her books, it's her phone. So I don't know how, how, how at 15, how are we going to introduce the tech-free zones without uh, having a conflict? And uh, how is it going to be possible to start telling her, hey, now, this uh, screen time is too much and your brain is going to start shrinking. Understanding and knowing the teenagers we are bringing up right now, being the only child, being someone who is used to her own space, kindly help there. I don't know if I'm speaking 
of someone else who also a single parent with only one child? Yes, that's a very good question. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, many people ask me that. Um, it's very, very important to note that the way we deal with the teenagers, the 14, 15 year olds is different from the way we deal with the 10, 11 and 12 year olds. It's also important to notice that they change even after that from age 17, 18, 19, they begin to shut us down. This is normal, eh? Uh, it's, it's God's wisdom. God in his wisdom decided that we will not spend all our lives with the parents we love. So he put something there for us to ensure that we turn away and start our own homes. It's a very positive thing. But the manner of turning away from you matters. Okay, matters a lot. In the case of the 15 and 16 year old, you cannot start making new rules in your house. It's it's not time. That's that that was for the 10 year old. That was for the seven year old and for the five year old. For the 15 year old and the 14 year old, what you need is discussions, adult like discussions. You need to sit them down and talk to them like an adult. The only way that will work is truth. Show them the truth. Do some homework yourself. Be aware. Go online and find the kind of videos I have shown you tonight. Your children are not dumb. Once they watch, for instance, how easy it is for a child to be kidnapped. If I had a 15 year old like you, I would show them that. I would show her that video and ask her, hey, your cousin, your, you know, that, that little girl who's your friend, do you think this could happen to her? What, what do you think about this? And you'll be surprised that uh, they think like you. Truth has a way of shining into everybody's mind when it is exposed, okay? Truth must be shouted from the rooftops, must not be hidden. So that's how it works with the teenagers. Discuss with them these truths. Okay. Find videos. Watch with them. And then after that, they will acquire what we call moral criteria. Because you will tell them, you see, this is what is happening to people's brains. You see this case, this guy was always on pornography, he became violent, he went to jail and so on. You see, that's why God forbids this type of immorality. Well, God forbids it first because it's unnatural. It's not the way he made us. And you can see the effects of it. So that's how to deal with it. But it also means we have to cultivate friendship with our young adult children. You have to deliberately spend time with them, know what their concerns are, and then be their friend. Yeah. If you have, those of you who have more than one child, it's easier because what you do is uh, start asking the, the, the elder sister or elder brother, what do we do about this? How about your little brother? What kind of rules do you think we should start here in case this happens to your brother or to your sister? And then it's easier to institute a family culture of healthy digital use. I hope somehow this answers the question. Eh? Sure, sure. It does. Uh, any other question? I see there's something on the chat. I hope. Um, uh, Cynthia says, I'm more concerned about parents who post anything and everything about their children. Doesn't this expose the children to predators? Yes, it does. And please, uh, those, some of you might be in the legal field. You already know that we have a we we have an, an uh, data protection act. Actually, it criminalizes this type of behavior. You could get into real trouble if you take photos of children, whether yours or not yours and post them online. 
especially if they are not your children. They're just visiting your house and you take a photo and it was a party and you post online on Facebook and it's for public viewing. You could get into serious, very serious trouble. Uh, please, let's be aware uh, about privacy rights, our own privacy rights and those of our children. Uh, let me see. Um, nothing else. Kindly, we have the re OK, that's about the recording. Any other question? Uh, I see there's a hand up. Uh, Irene, go ahead. Not audible on my end. I see Irene, you're unmuted, but I can't hear anything. Very faintly. I don't know if others can hear, but I, I had something very, very faintly. Sorry about that, Irene. I wonder if it's my end. No, she's not audible, even from here. She's not audible, okay. I'm just scrolling up and down the chat just in case she has posted her question there. Oh, <laughs> Irene. I was your teacher one time. Yes. Wonderful. Yes, it's Bishop Gati Mugani. Oh. That's a long time ago. That's like 30 years ago, right? Yes, it is. Ah, wonderful. Now I uh, have I have a question. A quick yes. one. Am I audible now? Yes, you are. Um, I have a 20 year old. I have three daughters. I've brought them up alone. I have a 20 year old for university. And her sister is 19 years old and the youngest is in form three. But I have an issue with speaking to them about choosing the right friends because once you speak to them about their friends, they withdraw. Like it becomes a no go zone. So I don't know how you're supposed to handle that. Mm. Yeah, that sounds so familiar. I think <laughs> all of us, all of us who've had uh, 20 year old children, 15, 13, and we've watched them grow up. Haven't we all gone through that? <laughs> uh, it's not easy to talk about good friends, the kind of friends they should have. Okay, That's one thing for sure. You're not alone in that. We all get through that. The thing is this, number one, a parent is a parent. You still have to say it. Even when they pretend they are not, they don't hear you. Say it. <laughs> uh, say it today and repeat it tomorrow. <laughs> my experience is that many years later, like my daughters, they come back and tell me, you remember one time you told us this? And I thought, what? You remember me telling you that, but you weren't listening. Uh, they listen and it changes them. They may not display a change in behavior at that moment, but they hear. Always tell them what you must tell them as a parent. And pray for them, of course, because parenting is more powerful when it is anchored in prayer. But you have to tell them. Eh? That's number one. Number two, tell them in a manner of discussion. Always admit to them that you don't know everything but you have more experience than them. Give them examples of relatives you know who, because of peer influence, because of the wrong circle of friends, things didn't work out for them, okay? Be careful, however, because this could be an uncle, a cousin, and so on, whom they have to interact with, and you don't want them to look down on them. So you have to put it in a, in a mature way, in ways in which you're not blaming the person. You could say they didn't have guidance, for instance, or they didn't get adequate protection from the adults around them, or whatever you need to say. But 
give them real life examples. If there are none among your relatives, go online. You'll be amazed what you can find online. Sometimes you can role play, okay? Sometimes you can use fiction, movies that you've watched, that you discuss with your children. Uh, your adult children or your teenage children don't like to be talked down upon. Ask them questions. Eh? Would you like to be like this? What do you think about this case? How about your little sister? Do you think she could easily get involved with the wrong company in primary school where she is? What do you think about that? What Could you advise your sister about that? That makes them reflect about their own company, about their own lives. Yeah. But I'm sure, I'm sure other parents here have experiences and can also assist me. Just put it there on the on uh, on the chat. That's what comes to my mind. Number one, don't stop parenting just because the reaction is negative. Keep talking, keep saying it. That's number one. And then number two. Say it in a slightly different way, as if it's a discussion. Have a family meeting sometimes and make it a little formal and tell them, hey, let's have a family meeting once a month. Let's talk about this. And sometimes just listen to them and don't say too much. You'll be surprised that they know these things. It's just that if you're talking too much, they feel the urge to oppose you. All right, uh, Rosaline is asking about adult children who are still in our house. <laughs> yeah, please remember that times have changed. Eh? Uh, 30 year old living with the mother, 30 year old living with the father is no longer uh, so strange. Okay. It depends on particular circumstances. Sometimes we need our adult children around us. Uh, we no longer have the social setup that allowed anybody at the age of 20 to leave the home. Sometimes they should not leave the home. Sometimes the parent needs them around. Okay. Also, uh, children are different. Some may need to leave a little earlier than others. There's no automatic answer to this. A 30 year old, totally mature, ready to marry. That's okay. They could leave, but they may not leave. Okay. They may need to stay around and look after their parents. That's how life is nowadays. Eh? There is no easy answer to this. But of course, um, when it comes to gadgets, which is what we are talking about, your house is your house. Please have a healthy digital culture. Don't just have the TV running all the time as if uh, the screen is just part of decorative furniture. No, no, no. Switch it off. Decide when it should be on. Are we watching news? Are we watching a movie? Why is it on? Okay. Involve your children in the decision. What are we going to watch? Why is it just running all the time even when nobody's watching? That's not healthy. Yeah. But most important, let them see you detox. Let them see you go off screens. Explain to them why your phone is off for 30 minutes every day. That's what I've been doing lately myself, okay? between 3 and 3.30, just switching off my all my gadgets just for detox. I have to work with screens all the time. It's part of my work. And so I need a lot more detox than the average person. Once a week, I detox uh, for a whole half a day. And then once a year, I go on a detox retreat, extended one full week. No phones, nothing, no screens, absolutely nothing, because I need to stay healthy. If the children see that you are the master of your gadgets, they will not like being slaves of their gadgets either. Yeah. Be the example. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, I need to just uh, add something. Um, uh, um, there's something which uh, he's mentioned, and I just wanted to let you know that there's a, there's a session that is coming up 
on parenting uh, for when you have adults. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure you can see my, I don't know if you can see my screen. There's this parenting session coming up on 5th June, uh, parenting young adults. Yeah, the topic, the topic is actually uh, focusing on taboo topics, uh, topics that we tend to keep uh, quiet about, yet they are real, real um, issues that we are facing. So maybe you can make a point on that. Yeah, it will be around the same time as this one. Um, yeah, but it will be on a Wednesday, not on a Thursday. It will be on a Wednesday. Yeah, not on a Thursday. So, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, she's, 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 she's having a, a challenge. Um, so, um, I think I think we can wind it up there. Um, I think can wind it up there. Um, this session, uh, most of most of it was recorded, and so I'm going to follow up with the admin to try and get the recording for those who had a challenge in joining, so that you can share it even further. Um, I'm going to request. Uh, for somebody to volunteer to pray for us. I'm seeing it's after nine o'clock. Um, if there's anyone who can volunteer to pray for us, that would be lovely. Okay, can I volunteer? Yes, I was actually about to. I was about to say to ask you. <laughs> I'm glad you volunteered <laughs> yourself. Yeah. Okay. Uh okay. let us all believe and pray. Father, we thank you and we bless your name. We worship and honor you because you are God and a great God, O oh Lord. We thank you because of the gift of parenting. We thank you for using us as vessels, Lord, to bring up these children because they surely do belong to you, Almighty Redeemer. We want to thank you because of even our, our presenter today. We thank you because King of all the glory over the knowledge that you've enabled him share with us. Jehovah, we pray that uh, may you give us the spirit to memorize. May you give us O oh Lord, the ability to have wisdom on how to put them into practicals in the name of Jesus. We are praying, Jehovah Father, for wisdom to parenting. We are praying, Jehovah Father, O oh God, for a way forward for those who are having challenges with their teenagers, with their young adults, O oh God. And Father, I pray you as the mediator, may you mediate, Almighty oh Redeemer. We pray for every child, King of all the glory, represented in this meeting today in one way or the other be extended nuclear oh god my father we saturate you uh, uh saturate your spirit upon them and we speak the blood of jesus upon our children we decree and declare your blessings upon them in the name of god the father the son and the holy spirit and father we pray that lord may all the blessings may all the graces that our children need oh god be bestowed upon their heads in jesus mighty name thank you for provision oh god and even those who are having challenges in provision may you provide mighty father we pray as we continue to learn god may you enable us oh god to understand oh father and to put in practical and above all may we parent these children in your way may you use us as vessels oh god to direct them in your way in the name of jesus cause us to be role models to our own children that no strangers are going to be their role models but we shall be their role models thank you for sitam rongai God, for putting this together, Almighty Father. Continue to use them. Continue to bless them. Thank you for the HOD, O oh God. We give you glory and we pray, O oh Father. May your spirit continue to minister to her in the name of Jesus and we pray for favor. Whenever she's looking for facilitators, O oh God, may she gain favor. My God, any eye of a facilitator that sees her, my Father, we pray that the mantle of favor will be upon her and they shall be the spirit of acceptance. Lord, to just facilitate. We want to bless you. 
We want to honor you. We pray for the night. Give us sleep and give us peace, oh God. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for staying the course. We really appreciate. Yeah. May God bless you. Yeah. Look out for the for the remaining class. It's only one more class um, that we're doing in this series. Yeah. And I'm sure it'll be worth attending. Yeah. Amen. 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 So I'll leave you with this.